Lesson four, the hard way. Sabbath afternoon, January 16. Brethren, with the beloved John, I call upon you to behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We may address him by the endearing name Our Father, which is a sign of our affection for him and a pledge of his tender regard and relationship to us. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but as a tiny rill to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father, and yet there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God in giving His Son to die for the world. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it, yet as we study the Bible and meditate upon the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes will open to our understanding more and more. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 739 and 740. Our trust must be wholly in God. He will be to us a present help in every time of need. Let us wait upon the Lord and exercise faith in His promises. He will hear us. Only believe. The captain of our salvation will not leave us to guide our own bark. We shall have his help and his wisdom just when he sees we need it. Letter 24, December 18, 1882 In a life wholly devoted to the good of others, the Savior found it necessary to withdraw from the thoroughfares of travel and from the throng that followed him day after day. He must turn aside from a life of ceaseless activity and contact with human needs to seek retirement and unbroken communion with His Father. As one with us, a share in our needs and weaknesses, He was wholly dependent upon God, and in the secret place of prayer He sought divine strength that He might go forth braced for duty and trial. In a world of sin, Jesus endured struggles and torture of soul. In communion with God, he could unburden the sorrows that were crushing him. Here, he found comfort and joy. In Christ, the cry of humanity reached the Father of infinite pity. As a man, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that should connect humanity with divinity. Through continual communion, he received life from God that he might impart life to the world. His experience is to be ours. The Desire of Ages, pages 362 and 363. Sunday, January 17. Prophecy Fulfilled In the hope of a sure inheritance in the earth made new, the early Christians rejoiced, even in times of severe trial and affliction. Ye greatly rejoice, Peter wrote, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The apostles' words were written for the instruction of believers in every age, and they have a special significance for those who live at the time when the end of all things is at hand. His exhortations and warnings and His words of faith and courage are needed by every soul who would maintain His faith steadfast unto the end. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 The apostles sought to teach the believers how important it is to keep the mind from wandering to forbidden themes or from spending its energies on trifling subjects. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled 
or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 517 and 518. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. It is faith that enables us to look beyond the present with its burdens and cares to the great hereafter where all that now perplexes us shall be made plain. Faith sees Jesus standing as our mediator at the right hand of God. Faith beholds the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for those who love Him. Faith sees the robe and crown prepared for the overcomer and hears the song of the redeemed. Faith is not feeling. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. True faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption, for presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the Scriptures. Gospel Workers, pages 259 and 260 Take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has He not invited you to come unto Him? Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. By looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you give evidence of a sickly, enfeebled faith. Talk and act as if your faith was invincible. The Lord is rich in resources. He owns the world. Look heavenward in faith. Look to Him who has light and power and efficiency. There is in genuine faith a buoyancy, a steadfastness of principle, and a fixedness of purpose that neither time nor toil can weaken. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 146 and 147. Monday, January 18. Foreseen Consequences The Lord brought Judah low because of continued transgression. In this time of chastisement, Ahaz, instead of repenting, trespassed yet more against the Lord, for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 19, 22, and 23. As the apostate king neared the end of his reign, he caused the doors of the temple to be closed. The sacred services were interrupted. No longer were the candlesticks kept burning before the altar. No longer were offerings made for the sins of the people. No longer did sweet incense ascend on high at the time of the morning and the evening sacrifice. Deserting the courts of the house of God and locking fast its doors, the inhabitants of the godless city boldly set up altars for the worship of heathen deities on the street corners throughout Jerusalem. Heathenism had seemingly triumphed, the powers of darkness had well nigh prevailed. Prophets and Kings, page 330. From the rise and fall of nations as made plain in the books of Daniel and the Revelation, we need to learn how worthless is mere outward and worldly glory. Babylon, with all its power and magnificence, the like of which our world has never since beheld, power and magnificence which to the people of that day seemed so stable and enduring, how completely has it passed away. As the flower of the grass, it has perished. James chapter 1 verse 10. And so perishes all that has not God for its foundation. Only that which is bound up with His purpose and expresses His character can endure. His principles are the only steadfast things our world knows. A careful study of the working out of God's purpose in the history of nations and in the revelation of things to come will help us to estimate at their true value things seen and things unseen and to learn what is the true aim of life. Prophets and Kings, page 548. Every individual must seek by earnest prayer to know the Word of God for himself and then to do it. Only in day by day, putting his trust in God and not in the arm of flesh, will any soul obtain the experience essential to answer the prayer of Christ. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. 
John chapter 17, verse 3. In all your temporal concerns, in all your cares and anxieties, wait upon the Lord. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the sons of man, because they may be in positions of trust. The Lord has united your heart with him. If you love him and are accepted in his service, bring all your burdens, both public and private, to the Lord and wait upon him. You will then have an individual experience, a conviction of his presence and his readiness to hear your prayer for wisdom and for instruction that will give you assurance and confidence in the Lord's willingness to succor you in your perplexities. This Day with God, page 82. Tuesday, January 19. What's in a name? The Lord's injunction, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, refers not only to the marriage of Christians with the ungodly, but to all alliances in which the parties are brought into intimate association and in which there is need of harmony in spirit and action. The Lord gave special direction to Israel to keep themselves distinct from idolaters. They were not to intermarry with the heathen, nor form any confederacy with them. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Exodus chapter 34, verses 12 to 14. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor chose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 8. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 122. We know but little of our own hearts and have but little sense of our own need of the mercy of God. This is why we cherish so little of that sweet compassion which Jesus manifests toward us and which we should manifest toward one another. We should remember that our brethren are weak, erring mortals like ourselves. Suppose that a brother has through unwatchfulness been overborne by temptation and contrary to his general conduct has committed some error. What course shall be pursued toward him? We learn from the Bible that men whom God has used to do a great and good work committed grave sins. The Lord did not pass these by unrebuked, neither did he cast off his servants. When they repented, he graciously forgave them and revealed to them his presence and wrought through them. Let poor, weak mortals consider how great is their own need of pity and forbearance from God and from their brethren. Let them beware how they judge and condemn others. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 246 and 247. How great is the long-suffering of God toward the wicked! The idolatrous Philistines and backsliding Israel had alike enjoyed the gifts of his providence. Ten thousand unnoticed mercies were silently falling in the pathway of ungrateful, rebellious men. Every blessing spoke to them of the giver, but they were indifferent to his love. The forbearance of God was very great toward the children of men. But when they stubbornly persisted in their impenitence, he removed from them his protecting hand. They refused to listen to the voice of God in his created works and in the warnings, counsels, and reproofs of his word, and thus he was forced to speak to them through judgments. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 587 and 588. Wednesday January 20. Nothing to fear when we fear God Himself. Our work is to proclaim to the world the first, second, and third angels' messages. In the discharge of our duties, we are neither to despise nor fear our enemies.
Putting our trust in God, we are to move steadily forward, doing His work with unselfishness and humble dependence upon Him, committing ourselves and all that concerns our present and future to His wise providence, holding the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end, remembering that it is not because of our worthiness that we receive the blessings of heaven, but because of the worthiness of Christ and our acceptance through faith in Him of God's abounding grace. This Day with God, page 196. The humility of Solomon at the time he began to bear the burdens of state when he acknowledged before God, I am but a little child, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7, his marked love of God, his profound reverence for things divine, his distrust of self, and his exaltation of the infinite creator of all, all these traits of character so worthy of emulation were revealed during the services connected with the completion of the temple when during his dedicatory prayer he knelt in the humble position of a petitioner. Christ's followers today should guard against the tendency to lose the spirit of reverence and godly fear. The scriptures teach men how they should approach their Maker with humility and awe through faith in a divine mediator. Prophets and Kings, page 47. Every soul is as fully known to Jesus as if he were the only one for whom the Savior died. The distress of everyone touches his heart. The cry for aid reaches his ear. He came to draw all men unto himself. He bids them, follow me, and his spirit moves upon their hearts to draw them to come to him. Many refuse to be drawn. Jesus knows who they are. He also knows who gladly hear his call and are ready to come under his pastoral care. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He cares for each one as if there were not another on the face of the earth. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts, it softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice and they follow him. The Desire of Ages, page 480. Thursday, January 21. Gloom of the Ungrateful Living Dead. Many are investigating spiritualism simply from curiosity. They have no real faith in it and would start back horrified at the idea of becoming mediums. But they are venturing on forbidden and dangerous ground. When they are fast in the toils of the deceiver, they find they are in the power of him who makes the most abject slaves of his servants, and nothing can deliver them but the power of God. The only safety for us is in trusting implicitly and following faithfully the instruction of the Word of God. The Bible is the only chart that marks out the narrow path which shuns the pitfalls of destruction. This Day with God, page 247. Satan is making the world believe that the Bible is a mere fiction, or at least a book suited to the infancy of the race, but now to be lightly regarded or cast aside as obsolete. And to take the place of the Word of God, he holds out spiritual manifestations. Here is a channel wholly under his control. By this means, he can make the world believe what he will. The book that is to judge him and his followers, he puts into the shade, just where he wants it the Savior of the world he makes to be no more than a common man. Says the prophet Isaiah, When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living, to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. The Story of Redemption, pages 396 and 397. I saw that soon, Satan's power would increase and some of his devoted followers would have power to work miracles and even to bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men. I was pointed back to the time of Moses and saw the signs and wonders which God wrought through him before Pharaoh, 
most of which were imitated by the magicians of Egypt, and that just before the final deliverance of the saints, God would work powerfully for his people, and these modern magicians would be permitted to imitate the work of God. That time will soon come, and we shall have to keep hold of the strong arm of Jehovah, for all these great signs and mighty wonders of the devil are designed to deceive God's people and overthrow them. Our minds must be stayed upon God, and we must not fear the fear of the wicked, that is, fear what they fear and reverence what they reverence, but be bold and valiant for the truth. Could our eyes be opened, we should see forms of evil angels around us trying to invent some new way to annoy and destroy us. And we should also see angels of God guarding us from their power. For God's watchful eye is ever over Israel for good, and He will protect and save His people if they put their trust in Him. Early Writings, pages 59 and 60. For further reading, The Upward Look, Hope Thou in God, page 222, and Patriarchs and Prophets, Ancient and Modern Sorcery, pages 683 to 689.